Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together. We ask our blessings for Father Day and that the words we speak will resonate in our hearts, into our mind that we may remember, and into our soul that we may meditate. May we use the knowledge to gain today for your glory and your Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say uh, Hail Mary first. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among him. And bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Ignatius Loyola. Pray for us. St. Anthony Mary Claret. Pray for us. St. Martin of Porus. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you know what ASAP means? Any of you know what that means? What is it? No, it's always say a prayer. Amen? <laughs> Let's uh, go from paganism to spirituality, right? Can I tell a joke? It's allowed in... Okay, okay. Can I? Okay, a, a woman told this joke in one of the presentations of one of our priests who was talking on the dignity of the woman, written by John Paul II, Dignitatis Mulieribus. And uh, the story of a man that was just married, and he had frequent locutions and visions of Jesus. So he's talking with Jesus and said, Lord, I'd like you to build a bridge from California to Alaska. And Jesus said, that takes a lot of time, effort, work, money. I can't give you that. So then the man said, well, Lord, let me ask you another petition. I'm just married to this wonderful woman, but she has these mood swings. Uh, one day she's happy, another day she's sad, another day she's giddy, other day she's intellectual. I cannot understand the heart of a woman. Can you please, Lord, tell me, explain to me the heart of a woman? Jesus said, now about that bridge, <laughs> would you like two lanes or three lanes? <laughs> All right, I've got a degree in English literature from Villanova. I have a degree in philosophy, theology, and jokeology. That's a good one, isn't it? All right, given that I only have uh, 45 minutes, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Uh, but being an English major, as well as trying to give you as much motivation to go deeper into this topic, I would suggest that all of you try to get the text of St. Ignatius, okay? So if you are voracious readers, I like good translations because also I write books too. Uh, this one by Poole is probably about the best, okay? So if you, if you like Ignatian spirituality, some of you have done the exercise with me. We invite you to come in a couple of weeks. This is probably the best translation of the text. Okay, here's the life of Ignatius. Okay, do any of you re like to read the lives of the saints? Okay, this is, it's, it's by, uh, translated by O'Callaghan, okay? O'Callaghan, Fordham Press. All right, then at the end of my talk, you're gonna love this. I have, I brought a first 
last relic of St. Ignatius to be with us. What a privilege, right? So it's a little part of his bone that someone gave to me, and I thought I would bring this to you. Do you like it? Okay, but do not cover your neighbor's goods. Don't want to take it, okay? <laughs> okay. I'll give you the blessing at the end, okay? All right, so where are we heading? To heaven, we hope, right? Okay, I'm going to give you what, is called, what are called the Ignatian Rules for Discernment. Now, to do justice to this, Father Tim Gallagher, who's been on EWTN the past 15 years, uh, would take many hours to explain these rules. And he also wrote a book on these rules, Father Tim Gallagher. So I'm going to have to move really quickly to get through these 14 rules. Okay, what is the background? Okay, the background is this. St. Ignatius was a soldier who lived a very worldly life, but God entered with what is called a providential accident. The providential accident happened in a place called Pamplona. Okay? Pamplona. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, just like me. Make sure. It's like this uh, new priest came in. He was kind of fumbling with the microphone, and he started the Mass by saying, there's something wrong with the microphone. And the people also said, and also with you. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully you won't say that in the end of my talk, okay? <laughs> okay, so the background is that he's living a very worldly life, sensual life, in which he's broken all the commandments, and uh, God intervenes with a providential accident. And you might want to see the movie done in the Philippines about three years ago of St. Ignatius. Pretty well done. They came out in public theaters in which you see a cannonball crashing through the castle in Pamplona. And the cannonball does not circumvent Ignatius, but it crashes into his two legs. And there he is with these two legs shattered. Okay, so then he's taken off the field. He's taken back to the castle of Loyola. And what happens there is is indispensable for us to understand the rules because Saint Ignatius has a long time for his period of convalescence, a long, long period. He almost dies. Now, if I were to ask you people this question, it would almost be an insult. Do you know how to read? Of course you do. But how many people could read 500 years ago? Not too many. So both Teresa of Avila, as well as Ignatius, they knew how to read, which was a huge advantage. So Ignatius had a very vivid imagination. So this is what happened. He had spent long periods of time, long hours, which he would be imagining himself approaching the beautiful queen of Spain being able to talk with her and eventually propose to her, and he's going to be Mr. Famous. So he'd spend long periods of time, hours. Don't forget, they didn't have the internet and TV and radio and the movies back then. So the imagination of the person back then was much more developed than our imagination, which is stunted par partially because of the electronics media. So. So he spends a long time in thinking about his escapades with this beautiful woman, the, the queen. It's all up here, okay, in his imagination. And when he starts to do this, he experiences a certain amount of pleasure on the surface of his soul. You might even say it better said on his emotions. Okay, then he falls into desolation. But he, got, he started to get bored, and he asked one of his relatives, please bring me some books to read. And he was expecting that his sister-in-law would bring him 
if I can use the word in Spanish, las telenovelas, okay? <laughs> Which would be the romantic literature of the knight in shining armor conquering the beautiful queen. That was the type of literature that he liked to read. As also Teresa of Avila, she had that same addiction to, you might call it mundane reading. Not that, not that it was pornographic, but it was very worldly, very mundane, very mediocre. But guess what? His sister didn't bring him those books, but rather the lives of the saints and the life of Christ. So he had all this free time and he started to read the lives of the saints. And something happened very different within him. It was like a fire was ignited and a firecracker exploded in his heart. He didn't experience desolation, but here's the key to understanding these, these rules. He experienced consolation. Then he'd go back to start, once again, to think about, in his imagination, his proposing to the queen. He experienced some, some pleasure, then once again, into desolation. Then he dropped that, and he'd pick up the book, he'd start to read, and this is what he said. You can read this in his autobiography. If Francis did it, I can do it. If Dominic can do it, I can do it. If Augustine can be converted, I can. If the Desert Fathers grew their long hair, I'll have longer hair. If the Desert Fathers had long fingernails with grease underneath them, I'll outdo them in that too. And after that, his heart was just overflowing with consolation. And then you read in this text, it says that his eyes were opened up a little bit and he recognized that one series of thoughts brought him to desolation and the other brought him to consolation. That's the background of these rules. You got it? So unless you understand his conversion experience in Pamplona, what happened in that long period of convalescence in Loyola, you're not going to understand the rules. So I've given you the, the background of the rules. Is that clear? Okay. Now there are two series of rules. Rules for the first week, which are 14 rules, and rules for the second week, which are eight rules. We will only be spending our talk today on the first 14 rules. Now the subscript at the very top of the rules explains the purpose of the rules. And it's this, so that we are aware that in our lives there are various motions within us. Okay? Spanish would be emociones and movimientos, if you speak the Spanish, okay? Motions or movements within us. One, leads us to desolation and the other leads us to consolation. Now those that lead us to desolation, Ignatius says, we have to reject and right away. Those that lead us to consolation, we have to, what do you think? Accept. Now, even though most of you are not trained in these, even though I see a couple of you have been with me for various years during the exercise, we've trained you already. Whereas the neophytes, this is maybe a novelty to you. Whether you understand these rules or not, it happens to every person on planet Earth, whether you understand it or not. Now, not knowing these rules, you, people are at a, at a huge disadvantage. Why is it that so many young people commit suicide today? They don't know the rules. So these rules can be applied to teenagers cutting their wrists or committing suicide because they don't know what to do in desolation. You hear me? So these rules, they're universal. Everyone in this world should know these rules. Like, I think most of you have heard the word desolation or consolation. You've never heard it explained before, but probably very few of you know what to do in desolation and what not to do. What to do in consolation 
and what not to do. And that's what Ignatius explains to us. In other words, uh, a decision and action made in desolation can be catastrophic. Can you give me a stronger word than that? Catastrophic is a strong word in English, no? It's not a word that's suave is in Spanish. It's a strong word. It can be catastrophic. So there's an interplay of these two spirits. Okay, now being, uh, uh, being an English major, I like to play with, a with what are called acronyms. I don't know if we have any teachers here. Good teaching devices utilizing acronyms. So I have coined my own acronym to summarize how to live out these rules. And it's a four letter word it's in grammar, it's called a conjunction. And the four letter word is B-U-T, but. Okay, with respect to these B-U-T, are you listening? Okay. okay, B stands for be aware. Be aware. Be aware of what's going on. Because if you're, if you're not, very few people have an interior life in which they're aware of these various movements. Even really good Catholics, they're not aware of these inner movements within their hearts. Therefore, they're, 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 they're stultified or, or stagnant in their spiritual life because they don't, they're not really aware of God's presence as well as the devil's presence. In other words, we're in constant warfare. You know, 24-7, we're in warfare. The devil works 25 hours a day, eight days a week, and 366 days a year. That's called hyperbole. Literary flair to accentuate a point, okay? It's called hyperbole. But we're always being attacked every day by the enemy, but we're not aware of it. So the B, be aware, you understand. Where is this coming from? Is this, is this coming from the good spirit or bad spirit? And then T, take action. Amen? Amen. Be aware, understand, and take action. For example, myself as spiritual director, when I'm talking with people, sometimes I'll say, stop, I'll stop the person and say, where is that coming from? What, Father? No, we're not going to move on. Where is that coming from? Is that coming from the bad spirit or the good spirit? And then I'll get the person to reflect. You gotta, you gotta name it, you gotta claim it, you gotta tame it, amen? <laughs> With another acronym for you, okay? Name it, claim it, and tame it. Okay, so there's my acronym that I have uh, constructed uh, to be able to live out these rules. Okay, now uh, let's uh, gallop through these rules as quick as possible, then we're going to be giving, we'll give you the rules. Mary has made a photocopy of the rules. Then we're going to be giving you also the five steps to make a daily examine. So to be able to live out these rules, you have to, you have to try to do the daily examine. That will probably be my talk next time I'm invited, if you do invite me, okay? The daily examine. And then third, I spent hours on Monday writing a running commentary on these rules for you people. Say thank you, Father. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, you got 11 pages, so it's kind of a summary. Father Tim's book is more than 100 pages, so this is like a summary of, you might say, uh, the book. So uh, you, you, can, you can read through the 11 pages in maybe 10 minutes. So you'll read the rules, you'll hear my talk, you'll read the commentary, so at least you'll understand the basics of these rules. Okay? Okay, 14 rules. Number one. Now what I've done is I myself have written a summary of the rule for myself. Uh, as, a, as, as a teacher and learner, I, I like to learn by having mnemonic devices. Uh, like a key phrase that triggers the whole concept. I think we all have different ways of learning, okay? But for me, a key phrase triggers the concept. Then as a teacher, as a concept, I illustrate it by, by a story. Okay? 
because good teachers are storytellers, right? Okay, the first rule. Okay, the first rule is the way the devil works and the good spirit works on a soul that is in a mortal sin. You're going to see, uh, the devil works in a very different way in a person that's in mortal sin and venial sin. And guess what the second rule is going to be? You can probably guess. Huh? So, let's take the first rule. A person is in mortal sin. What does the bad spirit do? He tries to increase the vices by presenting sensual delights, sensual delights in the imagination. Okay? Sensual delights in the ma imagination. Sensual gratification. So that the person will fall and fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. The devil wants to incite the imagination which incites the passions and the passion leads to action. Okay? So it's imagination, passion and action. Got that? That's the way the devil works. The imagination, we start up here, like a bad image, the passion, and then you give way to the action, consent to the will. That's the dynamic of the devil. Okay, so he wants a person to keep sin, and sin, and sin, and sin, and sin. He's sinning more and more, and more seriously. Until the person arrives at, what does Jesus say sin is in John chapter 8. It's slavery. Jesus in John chapter 8 says that sin is a form of slavery. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll use a word that Ignatius doesn't use. Okay, this is the word that we use today. It's called an addiction. Addictions. We've never in the history of the United States, had so many people with addictions as right now, and you know it. Addictions to drinking. The biggest addiction is pornography. You probably know that, right? Almost everyone has some minor addiction to that problem. That's one of the key causes that destroys marriages is, is addiction to pornography. That's called adultery of the mind, okay? Adultery of the eyes, adultery of the emotions, adultery of the heart that destroys marriages. So addiction. Okay, now, what would be the major triumph of the devil? This is still the same rule. We're going one step deeper. It is this, that the devil has benumbed the conscience suppress the conscience, cauterize the conscience, and he's killed the conscience. I deal with hundreds of people every week in a very busy parish. I love all the people, but I see some, many, many of them, their conscience is already dulled, it's eroded, it's suppressed, it's cauterized. In other words, if you have a healthy conscience, what happens? You do something bad, you feel bad. You do, you do something good, you feel good. That's, called, that's a sign of a, of, a, of a healthy conscience. I remember once hearing Father Frank Pavone, have you heard of him? Priest for Life? He said that he knew a woman that, that carried out 28 abortions, okay? That's a lot. So probably after the first, she had pangs of conscience after the second, maybe after the fifth, but after the fifth. It's kind of like the movie Go Gosnell. You ever, any, any of you see the movie Gosnell? Okay. Was this abortionist was actually playing the piano when they're talking about an abortion. He said, my daughter should have a right to do this. No? That we can actually suppress our conscience. And that's what the devil does. Now, I like the quote a Pope 
that was present when I was a little child. His name was Pope Pius XII. Have you heard of him? Okay. Pope Pius XII says this, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. Can you repeat that? Say it again. Once more. That's huge. And all of you know people that are in that category. If you ever meet someone, you're going to confession, and the, your husband or someone says, where are you going? I'm going to confession. What have you done, right? Are you one of those despicable persons we call sinners, no? We met all those people. Then, then you invite the person, why don't you come along with me? Wow, are you calling me a sinner? How dare you? <laughs> That's called the sin of the centuries, the loss of the sense of sin. Okay, the second part of the rule. Okay, so have you, understand, you understood the first part of the rule? Okay, okay the person is, is mortal sin. Imagination, passion, action. You're getting more and more temptation, falling and falling and falling and falling, falling, slavery. Slavery, addiction. Addiction into denial. Denial, the suppression of the conscience. This person is a slave of the devil. The devil's purpose is to drag him right into hell. I mean, the person can be saved. God's mercy is always infinite. We've got the goat thief, we've got Mary Magdalene. God's mercy is infinite. God can intervene in the soul a split second before he dies and the person says, Jesus, mercy is saved. But that person that's living that style of life, it's not good. Okay, the second part of the rule is to steal rule one. The Holy Spirit. Is our God a God of war or a God of peace? Both. Both. He's, he's, a God, he, he's a God of peace. He's the Prince of Peace, Isaiah, right? Shalom, peace be with you. But he's a God of war, too. Why? Because our God, he, he fights against sin in the souls of those he loves, and that's everyone. So those who are living in that state, now through, has to be silence and through ratiocination, which is a technical word, through the use of reasoning, through the use of reasoning, he's able to intervene and to plant a thorn in the person's conscience so that the person is no longer at peace with himself. So, interesting, the first rule of the Holy Spirit is taking away the false sense of peace. How good God is. Because the person is in a, is in a false sense of peace. Living in sin, but everything's okay. A-okay, I'm fine. Now the Holy Spirit is going to intervene in one way or another to make that person feel ill at ease. You know, like an analogy, you've got you're taking a walk and you have a little little pebble in your sandal. Ever happen? Or you're taking a walk and you get some dust in your eye. Ever happen? In other words, you don't feel at peace. You got to get the sandal. You got to get the, the the stone out. You got to get the the dust out of your eye. Okay, um, let me give you an example that I've used for many many years. So th these rules I use pastorally to try to save souls. Because my, my motto is to glorify God and save as many souls in the short life that God has given to me. That's my motto, which is St. Ignatius. I want to glorify God as much as I can, and I want to work with the Lord to save millions of souls. Excuse my extravagance, but let's go for, let's, let's go for it all, huh? Why diminish the power of God? No? We can do as much as we allow God to work in us. God is omnipotent. 
If you ask for a little, you're going to get a little. Ask and you receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. Matthew 7, 7, right? He who asks, receives. Okay, here's the example. For many, many years here, as well as when he started out in Buenos Aires as a young priest in Argentina, I would give the baptismal talk. The baptismal talk. When I arrived years ago, there was uh, double the number of the people that come in Spanish, but now that, especially, they have less kids now than 25 years ago. It's just a fact. The contraceptive mentality, abortion, Hispanic family when they came would have six, now they have three in one generation, right? Okay, so they come into the church and then I give the hour baptismal talk. Now what I do is like with you people, I, I always like to start out with a joke because you get a good joke then I get the people to like me, okay? <laughs> And he got you the palm of hand, and they can come down with the axe afterward, okay? <laughs> so what I do is I, I'll tell, I'll tell, Fulton Sheen would do it, tell, tell three jokes. One is okay, second is good, the third one is the best. Huh? So they tell him three jokes. Ah, that dead priest is Macanudo, he's great. Yeah, he's a good guy, no? He's a cool guy from New York. Hey, he's good, okay? And then after I've got them on my side, I look at the baptismal form and noticed Juan Garcia, he's not married in the church. Maria Guadalupe, she's not married in the church. Salvador Gomez, he's not married in the church. Susana, Alfredo, she's not married in the church. So what I say is, you know, I've noticed in these baptismal forms that most of you, you're not married in the church. You know, that, 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 that's not good. That's not good. You're not married in the church, so, you know, you, you're baptizing your child. You're not married in the church. You can't go to confession. You can't go to communion. You're giving a scandal to your children. Objectively, you're living in serious sin. And if you don't get out of this, then your soul is going to be lost for all eternity. And they start to talk. He's not as cool as we thought. <laughs> I thought he was a uh, tipo bueno, good guy, no? Uh -uh. He's kind of a, one, of those, one of those mean priests. One of those meanies, no? And what happened was, I accomplished exactly what I was planning to accomplish. They came in, Everything was A-OK. -okay. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and the fragrant redolence of the spring flowers they could smell in their noses, huh? But what I do, I threw cold water on, all on that. And there they leave the talk, bad-mouthing me in the car with their live-in, uh, getting angry at me, and the priest, he was pretty good at first when he told the jokes, but once he started to talk about our moral condition, he's not that good. He shouldn't do that. But out of our bedroom. What does he mean by doing that? But what happens is they're no longer in peace. Their conscience is in tranquil. I put the stone in their sandal. I put the dust in their eyes. I put some cucarachas in their pants, okay? <laughs> cucarachas in those pantalones, huh? There you go. And what happens is two weeks later, 
they call and say, Father Broom, could we talk with you? Because we'd like to get married in the church. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You see, I, I, I'm, I, I'm clever. I'm, 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 I'm a student. I'm, I'm, I'm clever. Jesus says you have to be as simple as doves, but you have to be as clever as serpents, right? Didn't Jesus say that? So I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm clever. And I, all, I use this to praise God and to save souls. Do you understand? Hello? Very important rule. And, and you, 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 can, you can use this rule in your family. And you have to pray over it, and you have to really get to know the rule. But you, you can use this rule in your family. It might be, okay, you have a, you have a daughter. You have a daughter that's living with her boyfriend. She already has two kids. And she's happy. One day you, you take her aside, you have a long conversation, a cup of coffee with her and say, you know, honey, I really love you. But the fact that you're, you're living with, with John, you're not married to church, is causing me intense suffering. Because I brought you into this world to bring you to heaven. God gave me to you. God gave you to me as a means by which I can bring you to heaven for all eternity. Therefore, your living condition is, is causing me a lot of suffering. A lot of suffering. And maybe a couple of tears, allow the tears to trickle down your cheeks. You know? Allow it. And your daughter's watching that. Wow. So after that, she starts to think, you yeah, know, I'm really not at peace. I'm going to talk with Father. I'll get married in the church. It might happen in your family. I think all of you don't have the exact scenario, but something like that where you can apply this rule to your own life. Pray over it. So these rules are not simply for us, but as a as a pastoral, as a pastoral tool to save many, many souls. A pastoral tool to save many, many souls. Okay, what I'm going to do is this. Given that I have 10 minutes, um, I'm not going to get through, I'm, I'm going to just explain one more of the rules. I prefer to go in detail and then you'll be able to read my commentary and you'll be able to uh, maybe read the book. What I like to do is I like to jump from the first rule to the last rule. Okay? Okay? Uh, because I only have a few minutes and I prefer to just expound it upon the first rule is the foundation. Okay? Uh, in these rules, implicitly present in all these rules is the devil as well as a good spirit. Now the 14th rule, okay rule, okay, rule 12, 13, and 14 are rules that explain explicitly the way the devil works. The other rules, implicitly, you know the difference between implicitly and explicitly, right? Okay, I'll explain, okay. Implicit means indirectly. Okay, explicit means in your face, directly. So I'd like to jump to the 14th rule. Okay, this is the way the devil works. Okay, I, if you read through my commentary, please read through my commentary and don't use it as an airplane or use it for your birdcage, okay? <laughs> you have a birdcage, okay? Is... I call it the kryptonite rule. When I was a kid, I used to watch all these intellectual programs back in the 60s, the Three Stooges, uh, <laughs> Superman, okay? 
Remember Superman? Clark Kent? Okay, was, super, was Superman strong or weak? Always? So he was always strong under one condition, which was? That he was not exposed to kryptonite, okay? He was not exp ex exposed to kryptonite. When he was ex exposed to kryptonite, he was weak. It's the rule in which you have to know your kryptonite. You have to know your kryptonite. You want another analogy? Was Samson strong or weak? Samson, remember? Sammy boy? I call him Sammy boy. Eh? Was he strong or weak? Until he became an L.A. cholo. He got rid of his hair, okay? He, his strength was in his hair, right? He made the Naz Nazaritic vow. Okay? Never cut his long locks. Then Delilah, Delilah went after him, right? And then he became weak. Any of you read any classical Greek literature, Achilles? Was Achilles strong or weak? Unless, right? Achilles heel. So you have to know your kryptonite, you have to protect your Achilles heel, and you have to keep your hair long, okay? <laughs> Some of you have to grow your hair a little bit longer, okay? Or uh, get, get, get a wig, okay? <laughs> Hopefully there's no strong sun down the wind to blow it off, okay? Yeah. So the kryptonite rule is this. The devil... St. Nasus says he presents a, a medieval fortress. So if you ever study uh, the Middle Ages, they would have like a feudal society where you'd have a fortress and a structure. Teresa of Avila calls it Castillo, a castle, and it's surrounded by a moat so that the castle would be protected from being sacked and plundered. Okay? So Ignatius takes that image, because he's living at the tail end of the Middle Ages, and he says that this castle is, guess who? That's us. The castle is us. And who's the enemy? Yo, Chamuco, right? Okay. The devil, right? And what does the devil do? He goes around, he goes around, he circles, he tries to find an opening, and then he goes for the kill. Do any of you know the definition that St. Peter gives of the devil? He said, the devil is like a roaring lion. Remember that passage in St. Peter? He's like a roaring lion on the prowl seeking he who he can devour, resist him, solid in the faith. Amen? Amen. St. Peter. So, the devil circles all of us to see what is our weak point. What is our weak point? If you want another image, maybe more under, easy for you to understand, is I, I know that most of you are grieving this morning because the Dodgers lost to the Boston Red Sox, okay? <laughs> okay, if you know anything about sports, I, I played baseball at Villanova, so I know the sport pretty well, okay? I'm still grieving because the Yankees lost, but I shouldn't say that here. <laughs> Maybe next year, okay? But anyway, if you, if you watch it, uh, Kershaw was against Sales, possibly the two best pitchers in the National League and the American League. I mean, Kershaw was, was, was trying to throw breaking stuff and balls 95 miles per hour on the inside corner, the outside corner, out and away, a brushback pitch. I mean, these guys, are, these, guys, these guys are incredible. But Sales was better, he, he, he was on. Now, if I can apply this to this rule, 
The devil is an excellent pitcher. He's an excellent pitcher. He knows exactly where to throw the ball to make a strikeout. Strikeout means to make a sin. When I was, I was in eighth grade, I played Pony League baseball, and they told us never to throw the curveball until you're in high school. I said, ah, who cares about that? So I was practicing. You ever see the curveball? You have to take the ball, and you have to violently break your wrist. That's the motion of a curveball. Okay? So I, I pitched a no-hitter. You know why? I never made it to the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Dodgers, no? Because I knew that these kids that were 13, they never saw a curveball and I was on. And they were bailing out right and left. So I, I had a lot of what's called KKK. That's not the Ku Klux Klan, okay? <laughs> K means strikeout in baseball. So the devil knows, he knows you. And if you can hit a curveball, he'll throw a fastball. If you hit the ball on the, on the right side corner, he'll throw it in the inside corner. That's the rule. Now, in concrete, if you want to get to know yourself, know what your kryptonite is, come to my spiritual exercises program, week four. How many have done the exercises? That's about half of you will see the other half in November, right, Mary? Okay. <laughs> We're going to have invitation forms, as well as my books, as well as, well as other retreat experiences I'm giving. But our fifth week, our fourth week, rather, is the, is the rule for the kryptonite. And that is, get in to know yourself by the capital sins. Okay, what are the capital sins? Gluttony, lust, avarice or greed, sloth or laziness, envy, anger, and what is the root of all sins and that is the sin of pride. One occasion I was giving a retreat and this young woman said, Father, I've got all of them. <laughs> You're kind of laughing, but can I tell you something? So do I. But one is predominant. It's like when you go to college, you got your major and your minor. There's going to be a major and a minor. Now, if you know though, if you know your capital sin, that's your kryptonite, then you can place all the means at your disposition to prevent the enemy from striking you out. Okay, so I've been able to go through two rules in 50 minutes, and I'll try to be faithful to the program, and I'll say a closing Hail Mary so that you can move into your other activities, okay? So let's say Hail Mary, that we'll be able to really at least understand these rules and try to put them into practice. Amen? Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, amen. And bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners. So right now I'm going to give you the blessing of St. Ignatius of Loyola. This is part of the the body of St. Ignatius is a part of his bone. So we're going to give you the blessing that all of us will take seriously these rules, try to read through them, learn them, and especially put them into practice. Remember, but, be aware, understand, and take action. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you through the intercession of St. Ignatius and the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and have a great day.